we go to school in science class, we learn about laws of science or laws of nature. For instance, the law of gravity, which is basically stuff falls down. Uh, it's more technical than that. It's something to do with objects attracting one another, inverse distance mass, that kind of good thing. But we have the story of uh, Sir Isaac Newton sitting under the apple tree. The apple did not fall on his head, as it often says, but he saw an apple fall. I uh, thought of the apple falling, and that got him thinking about gravity. So there's a law of gravity. Stuff falls down. And we can talk all we want about uh, having our own opinion about things. Whatever your opinion is, stuff is going to fall down. It's a law. It's gravity. Another law is the second law of thermodynamics. That basically means uh, your room doesn't clean itself. It gets messy by itself, basically. Second law of thermodynamics is that all things tend toward entropy or disorder. Uh, all things in the universe are breaking down by themselves. Unless you infuse some type of uh, energy or information into something, it will break down. And the whole universe is breaking down. Second law of thermodynamics. Well, I'm here to tell you there are also spiritual laws. Spiritual laws that cannot be broken. What's the spiritual law of salvation? Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. That is a spiritual law. It's as sure as the law of gravity. If you believe in Jesus with a saving faith, if you're trusting in him, your sins are forgiven, you go to heaven, you're a child of God. There's a second one I want to talk about today, and I gave it a name. So it sounds like the law of thermodynamics. I'm calling it the law of personal dynamics. And I did an internet search, no one else has coined that term yet. So it's mine. Uh, the law of personal dynamics, which uh, Jesus expresses in Luke 17, 33. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life will keep it. I believe that is a law as solid as the law of gravity, as solid as the second law of thermodynamics or the law of salvation. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. Now we can apply that to salvation. You trust in yourself, you trust in your own good works, you trust in being better than other people, uh, try to save yourself, you will be lost. Uh, but you entrust your soul to Christ instead. You lose yourself, give yourself to him, and you'll be saved. But I want today especially to apply it to our personal life. If you live for yourself, you will be miserable and unfulfilled. If you live for yourself, you try and save your life, try and preserve your life, you will be miserable and unfulfilled. But if you live for other people, your life will be full, productive, satisfying, and most of all, Christ-like and God-pleasing. Let's pray together and ask the Lord, to instruct us. Father in heaven, we need to be instructed. We need to be challenged. We need to be changed. That's one of the reasons we come here every Lord's Day. We want to hear a word from you to tell us what needs to happen in our lives. So speak to us through the scripture this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If I've heard this once, I've heard it dozens of times. Someone's going through a midlife crisis, man or a woman, and what I hear is, you know, I've spent all these years living for other people. Now it's time for me to live for myself. What that basically means, I'm going to ditch my kids and wife and get a girlfriend. That's basically what that means. Uh, but that, that kind of, have you heard that before? I've spent all my time living for other people. Now I'm going to live for myself. Well, you know what? The spree of self-indulgence, which hurts your family and other people, is not going to end well. The law of personal dynamics says he who tries to preserve his life will lose it. Uh, perhaps you're depressed from time to time, maybe right now. Um, feeling worthless, feeling defeated, hopeless, empty. There's a lot of things you could do, but here's a good one. Buy a bag of groceries and take it to someone who doesn't have any money. Find someone that's lonely or shut in and go sit with them and talk for a while. Pray with someone who is dying. Relieve someone who is overworked. A young mom has, has got kids and can't uh, get any time away. You know, relieve her, do some babysitting for her. Do something for someone else and watch that depression dissipate. Watch that feeling of worthlessness, uh, just getting your mind off yourself, because that, that seeking for self-esteem is just another form of self-indulgence. You're thinking about yourself and not others. We have the example of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Continue our look through this uh, wonderful book. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says this, beginning at uh, verse 14. Here for the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be a burden, for I seek not what is yours, but you. An interesting phrase. I seek not what is yours, but you. For children are not obligated to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. I will most gladly spend and be spent 
for your souls. If I love you more, I might be loved less. I want you to ask yourself three questions as I'm asking myself these same questions. First of all, what am I seeking? Paul says, I will not be a burden, for I seek not what is yours, but you. He says, I'm coming for the third time. Uh, just a little background here. Paul first went to uh, the city of Corinth in 50 AD, about five years before he wrote this letter. And that's when he founded the church. He led these people to Christ. He, he shared the Lord with them. He built them up in the faith and established a church here. About five, he was there about a year and a half, which in Paul years is a long time. So he doesn't sit still very much. He was there a year and a half. His second visit in 54 AD was what he just calls the painful visit, chapter 2 and verse 1. There is a, there is a, a blow up. There is a, the relationship is, is like destroyed. Things do not go well in, in this painful visit. And now shortly after, he's writing this letter uh, because he wants to straighten things out. Things have not gone well between them. He wants to come and straighten that relation out. <clears throat> that will be the third letter. That'll, or pardon me, that will be the third time he comes. He says, I'm ready to come to you. For a while, he wasn't ready. They weren't ready. He wasn't ready. And sometimes that's true. Sometimes you want to solve a problem with another person, and it's just not time yet. Emotions are too raw. The situation just needs to kind of sift out and, and filter down a little bit. He says, but now I'm ready to come to you. So he's sending this letter. He sends some delegates ahead of him to kind of feel things out and prepare the way. And he says, when I come, I will not be a burden. He's speaking about finances here. Look at the context. We talked about this. He wouldn't, he said, I'm not going to accept a penny from you folks. Uh, you know, other places he has, uh, he, he's a worker worthy of his hire, but he says, I'm not going to take a penny. Uh, he decided that. But here, he says, this is proving something, that my motivation is pure. I'm not, searching, uh, I'm not seeking what is yours, but I'm seeking you. I'm not seeking what is yours. I don't want your possessions. I don't want your money. I, I don't want uh, anything that you have. I don't want what is yours. Now, you know, there's rich preachers that, that seek what is other people's. I, I looked it up. The richest pastor in the world is not even American. He's from a third world country, from Nigeria. Who has money in Nigeria? Well, this guy is worth $150 million. He has four private jets. He has homes in the U.S. and in England. I have a hard time with that. I have a real hard time with that. In a country that poor, how can a, a preacher get that rich? Um, but also even preachers in, in more normal circumstances can be in it for the money. One of my professors at seminary uh, said he, he went to visit uh, what we call a liberal seminary, one that didn't really believe the Bible and that kind of thing. And he, he asked one of the students, so you, you don't believe the Bible is true and, and you don't believe in Jesus born a virgin, et cetera, et cetera. Why are you going into this? His answer was, it's as good a racket as any. It's as good a racket as any. Well, that's what it means to seek yours. I'm trying to make a living off you. Paul says, I don't come to seek yours. I come to seek you. Now, what does that mean, to seek you? What is it that Paul wanted with these people? Basically, two things. He wanted their trust, a close, healthy relationship. He wanted their trust. He wanted them to believe him when he said something. You know, sometimes there's promises you can't believe, statements you just know aren't true, and how can you have a relationship with that person? Stories told about this man that tried to teach his boy a lesson, young boy. He sits him up on the stairs. He says, I need to teach you a very important lesson in life here. Jump. The boy says, Daddy, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. No, you can trust me. Jump, I'll catch you. Daddy, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. I, you can trust me, I'll catch you. Okay, Daddy, here I come. Dad steps aside, bam, the kid falls on the ground. He says, let that be a lesson to you. Don't trust nobody. Okay, well, what kind of relationship do you have with a father like that? Thankfully, most fathers are not like that. What kind of relationship can you have with someone whom you don't trust? Trust is the key. And the more the trust, the better the relationship. Now, when I go overseas, as I have a few times to teach, I'm teaching students that I'm only going to be with for like two weeks, two and a half weeks at the most, sometimes only one week. Any teacher will tell you, you need to have the trust of your students. I mean, a pastor, when you come first to a church, it takes time to get people to, to build up a trust in you so they'll share things with you, so they'll be, not be afraid to ask you a question that you're gonna, not going to treat them as dumb or something like that. It takes time to do that. So I'll go to Africa or I'll go to Russia and I'll get this class of students and I'm only going to see them for a week or two. And it, it's really hard the first couple of days to get their trust. But, you know, the Lord is blessed. And it was nice the second time I went back to Africa to teach. It was the same students I had before. So we started 
started out running. I didn't have to take a couple of days to get them to know me and to trust me. Uh, right from the beginning, they're asking questions, interacting with me. You need trust. Well, so when Paul says to these people, I care about you, he wanted them to believe him. When Paul says to these people, Jesus is the promised Messiah, he died on the cross for our sins, he wants them to believe him. They need to trust him. And so that's very important to Paul. When he says, I seek you, he means I seek you to trust me in a close relationship. Another way of looking at it, he wanted them to believe in him. In other words, to be able to trust him to be who he says he's going to be, that he is called of God, that he's qualified, that he's reliable, he's not going to quit, he's not going to betray. You know, I think it's important for parents to believe in their kids, don't you? I believe it's important for parents to affirm their kids because you're going to see good things in your kids that no one else sees. I mean, you're going to see bad things no one else sees too, but we're not going there today. You're going to see good things in your kids that no one else sees, and if you don't affirm that, who's going to? They're going to be people who, uh, adults and other kids who don't like your kids, who, who uh, try and tear them down, who pick on them. They need someone in their life who's always going to be in their corner, going to stick up for them and affirm them. You need to believe in your kids, to see the good, to see the potential that others do not see. Paul wants the Corinthians to feel that way about him, to believe in him, to, to trust him for what he says, and to trust him as a person, who he is. So that, that brings us to another point. Gaining trust is not an end in himself. He says, when I says, I seek you, I seek the relationship, but he says, I seek your well-being. He goes on, for children are not obligated to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. Now, in this illustration, Paul is the parent, and the Corinthians are the children in this illustration. He's not saying they're childlike. He's just saying, let's make this an analogy. Raising children, there's a moral obligation the mom and dad have to provide for their children. That's a moral obligation to do that. When we find a parent is not feeding their kids, not clothing them properly, not giving them attention, we say that is a bad parent. That's horrible. How can they be that way? It is a moral obligation for parents to take care of their children. Um, now, I'm not to say kids aren't supposed to do chores. Not what I'm saying. Uh, my kids can tell you, my favorite saying is, get to work, that's what I had you for. Okay? <laughs> so kids are supposed to work. But you compare what they contribute to what they cost, and it's not even close. Okay? You could do it better than they could when you tell them to do this or that chore. Uh, so what they contribute is this much, what they cost is this much. I'm not talking about just money cost. I'm talking about emotional investment, spiritual investment in the children, time investment. You know, it's not even close. So good parents gladly give that expense and spend themselves for their children. They set aside for their children as their parents did for them, as my parents did for me. They seek a closeness with the children based on trust for the greatest good of the children. Why do they do this for their kids? Because they want the best for them. They want them to be the best possible, the best life. So when he says, I seek you, he says, I seek for you to have the best life possible, to have the best relationship with the Lord possible. Now especially, I believe this means we should be concerned for that other person's spiritual well-being. Notice in verse 15 what Paul says here. He says, I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. Now, I'm sure he's, he's concerned about their body. If they don't have food, he'd want to give them food. If uh, they're, they're sick, he'd want them to, to have some relief from that, to, to heal up. But the most important thing is for their souls, most important of all. What could be more important than a person's personal salvation? A person being saved and on his or her way to heaven. What could, what could be more important than that? Jesus said, and answer this question, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? What's the answer? What's the profit him? Nothing. That's foolish. Go back to parents and children. Say you give your children the whole world and they die and go to hell. What does it profit them? What does it profit? Paul, writing to Philemon, says to him, he reminds him, he says, you owe me even your own self. You owe me your own self. Because Paul had led Philemon to the Lord. And, and Paul says, you owe your own self to me, your very life in Christ. You returned, you owe that to me. Paul is, you know, calling, calling in some favors here, by the way. If you want to look at the book of Philemon. You owe me your own self. All kinds of helpful things we can and do for other people. And each one is good, but number one, what does it profit if we give someone the whole world and they end up dying and going to eternal hell? This is the most critical step in seeking the well-being of another person. 
is a sake for the well, seek for the well-being of that person's soul. But he also to help others grow stronger and more fruitful in Christ. Paul said of the Galatians, he says, My little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. I am in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Now your ladies are saying, what does a man know about the anguish of childbirth anyway, right? Well, he heard them talk about it because they talked about it back then too. Okay? And he says, this is how I feel the anguish of childbirth. He says, and that's a powerful pain until Christ is formed in you. He says, I'm giving myself for you. So, so parents, let's go back to the parent-child thing here. They were applying it more broadly. What is more satisfying to you? That your child gives you a, a, a gift, maybe gives you some money, $20, $100, whatever. What means more to you, that? Or you see your child make a very powerful, godly decision for Christ in his or her life. You, you see them do an act of sacrifice for someone. You see them stand against a strong temptation with courage. You, you see that child really stand up for God. What means more to you? You know, the, the 10 bucks is nice. You know, go ahead and give it to me, right? But what I really want to see is my kids having Christ formed in them. That's the most important thing. And again, apply this more broadly to other people as well. So our first question is, what are you seeking with respect to other people? It should be the good of others, a for, firm relationship with them that you can help them find by, in Christ. So losing your life for others, you save it. Secondly, what am I spending? Second question to ask yourself, what are you seeking? Are you seeking a close relationship with others so you can see the most good in their lives from Christ? What am I spending? Paul says, I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. Now, he's not talking just about money here when he talks about spending. In fact, not even mostly about money. He talks about being spent. He's talking about himself as a person. Think about what he said uh, earlier in this book of the Macedonians. He says, they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. They gave themselves. Now, it's been a half a century ago, but I remember reading A Tale of Two Cities, and I think I remember in the beginning of the book, uh, there's a, a rich nobleman in France who's riding down the muddy street, and they strike and kill a child. Am I remembering it right? And so the, the, the person in the carriage throws a coin out to the parent and then moves on. What's that? It was a coin? They just killed their kid. Well, it's more than just money. It's more than just giving a token to someone else. Paul talks about spending and being spent. In what ways should I, should you, spend and be spent? Well, first of all, material giving can be part of it. Money, clothing, food, whatever. The Bible says, if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? And that's why Jesus and the disciples had a treasury. They had a treasury that they carried around to help the poor. And so that's, that's very valid. Today, there will be individuals who have physical needs that you can help relieve, and you should do that. Uh, we have our church deacon fund where anonymously we, we give to folks in need. There's groups like Compassion International, Bibles for the World, where you can sponsor a child in a third world country living in poverty. There, there's a lot of ways we can and should do that kind of thing, but this in itself is not it. When Paul talks about spending and being spent, I believe that means his labors, his life. There's no substitute for pitching in and getting to work to help other people. This means an investment of time, of energy, of what we call emotional capital, and spiritual capital as well. First of all, time. Ephesians 5.18, or pardon me, 5.16 says, we should make the best use of the time because the days are evil. Uh, the Greek word is literally buy up the time. Buy up the time because the days are evil. And I've noticed there's still only 24 hours in a day. And my life doesn't seem to get any less busy as time goes on. In fact, it's, it's the old saying, it just goes faster as you get older, and it really does. Uh, I don't know what that's all about, but there, there it is. You know, we're all busy, and it's very easy for our time to be consumed just like that. But it's very easy to consume our time on ourselves, and then it's all gone. There's always time to do whatever is a priority for you. Whatever amount of time you have, there's always the time to do what's your priority. Your days and hours will be filled with what you choose to do. Isn't that right? The second, third, and fourth things down the line, you may not get to them. You've got a priority list of things that are going to take your time. The first thing will definitely get done. Second one might. Third one maybe. Fourth one probably not. That's just the way it works. So if helping other people is number three or number four on your list of priorities, you're probably not going to do a whole lot of helping other people because you're just not going to have time for it. 
So time, an investment of time, moving that up on the priority list above yourself. Energy is also a limited resource. We only have so much energy. At the end of the day, you can be tired. Uh, you know, we're going to spend a lot of energy for Vacation Bible School, uh, VBX. We're going to spend a lot of energy for that. But it's worth it. It's absolutely worth it. But we only have so much energy. You work all day, and then you come in here, help with VBX, and, and then you go home and whew, get up the next morning you know, for five days. A lot of energy, but it's worth it. But, you know, if we spend that energy instead on selfish pursuits, there's that much less energy you'll have for others. Emotions. Seeking the good of other people will be emotionally draining. Seeking the good of other people, investing your life in them, will drain your emotions. You'll come home, blah, 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 blah. You know, you, you're just going to feel totally out of it. That's the way it happens. You know, the Lord has an infinite supply of compassion and patience. You and I do not. We do not have an unlimited supply, an infinite supply of passion, compassion, uh, compassion, patience, and sympathy. So if I invest all of my emotional capital in my favorite sports team, if I invest all of my emotional capital in, um, in unnecessary drama in my life, or in the news, well, you can spend a lot of emotion watching the news. You really can. You really get into it. If you do all that, there's not going to be any emotional capital left for helping other people. So again, we need to make it a priority. And then, of course, there's spiritual capital as well. You only have a limited amount of that. Just the example of prayer. Prayer is hard work. Paul speaks in the book of Colossians about a man named Epaphras. He says he is always struggling on your behalf in his prayers. The Greek word struggling is the Greek word agonizomai. We get a word agony from it. It means to struggle in a contest against opposition. And Epaphras was struggling, agonizing in prayer. You can only do that for so long and, and you, run, you run out of steam. You can only do it for so long. And so if, if your spiritual resources have just been used on yourself, you're not going to have time and energy or the spiritual energy to be able to encourage, to teach, to witness. It takes a lot out of you. But Paul says... For you, he says, I was gladly, gladly spend and be spent. Now, Paul had no hesitation in admitting his exhaustion in living for God and spending himself for others. Just in this book, chapter 1, verse 8, we were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired even of life. Chapter 2 and verse 4, for I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart and with many tears. Chapter 4, verse 16, our outer self was wasting away. Chapter 7, verse 5, we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. Paul was spending and being spent radically for others. And in doing this, wasn't Paul just simply following the perfect example of Christ who spent himself for us? Mark chapter 10, and verse 45, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So what are you spending what are you spending? Your material wealth, your labors, your time, energy, emotions, spiritual resources. How much of that is for self? How much of it is for others? The second question, what are you spending and for whom? Third question, what makes me sad? Or I might put it this way, what breaks your heart? What breaks your heart? Chapter 12 again, verse 15, the last part. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? Why do you say that? If I love you more, am I to be loved less? Why do you say that? It's because they were loving him less. And that broke his heart. He had given themselves to them. He had just poured himself out. And they were loving him less. He says, is that the way it's supposed to work? You're supposed to love me less because I'm giving myself so fully for you? That broke his heart. Now, this is not a law because it's not always true. You know, like the law of uh, the one of Jesus there. Uh, thankfully, it's not always true. But just an observation, I think others will bear this out. Some of the people to whom you give the most will be the very ones to stab you in the back. That, that's just an observation. Some of the people to whom you sacrifice and give the most will be the very ones to betray you. I mean, it happened to Jesus with Judas. We're no better than he, are we? Well, in the context here, Paul is disappointed at their response to his love and sacrifice. He's brokenhearted over it because a good number of them had turned on him and betrayed their love for him. Now, he could just blow it off and say, well, you know what? You're a loss, not mine. Plenty of other people out there I can deal with. I, I don't need you. But he couldn't do that. He invested so much of himself into them. 
He loved them so much, it bothered him that they did not love him back. He couldn't live with that. That's why he's writing this letter, to regain that closeness again. Now, this is not self-indulgent sadness. You know, I'm, I'm hurt because you don't love me. You know, it's not, nobody loves me, everybody hates me. I'm going to go eat worms. Remember one of the first songs you learn? Big, fat, juicy ones, little, skinny, squirmy ones. See how they wiggle and squirm, bite their heads off, suck the guts out, throw the skins away. <laughs> nobody loves me, everybody hates me, I'll eat worms today. That's not what Paul is doing here. He's not feeling sorry for himself. He's sad because their poor response limits how much good he can do for them. Their poor response, their lack of love for him limits. It's, 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 they're doing this. So how can he help them the way he wants to? How can he bring more of Christ into their lives? To the degree that they love him less, he's heartbroken and he's frustrated. And the biggest frustration in ministering to other people, working with other people, is you care about someone who is suffering you know that you have what they need to end that, and they do this. That's the biggest frustration and heartbreak there is. They will not listen. They put up, they pull away and pull up, put up walls. That's frustration and sadness that Paul is fearing here. So what makes you sad? That's our third question here. What frustrates you with other people? Is it that your feelings are hurt or that you cannot do the good that God wants you to do for them because of walls of mistrust and negativity that they are putting up? This is the sadness to which you open yourself up when you give yourself and live for the good of others. Some people will not be helped, and that's a sad reality. Uh, but others will respond to your loving concern in a positive way. They'll be blessed by you, and they'll love you the more for it. So the law of personal dynamics. Again, Luke 17, 33. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. Try to make your life good by living yourself, and guess what's going to happen? If you carefully invest your time and emotions in your own comfort, your own pleasure, your own advantage, mark these words, you will lose. You will lose. It won't work. Your life will not be full. It will not be meaningful. It will not be productive. But go ahead and recklessly lose your life for others. Spend and be spent as the first priority, bringing others to Christ and Christ to others. Meeting whatever need you can whenever you can. Take this to the bank. It will work. It will work. Your life will be full and meaningful and productive. This is as sure as the law of gravity. We ignore it to our peril and observe it to our blessing. Now, 